So hey, everybody, we are here on location at Revitalize MD. You can tell we've got a different, very cool setting. I had the pleasure today of talking with Dr. Deb Durst and her nurse practitioner, Faraday Golombieski, about all things hormone replacement, vaginal rejuvenation, um, peptides, a bunch of stuff I really didn't know about. I learned a ton. It was a great interview. So check it out, hit the little bell button, subscribe, like, share it with your friends, um, and get ready for a great show. Hello, everyone. It's Dr. Durst, and welcome to RMD, All Things Aesthetics and Wellness podcast. And I have a special guest with me. I have Faraday, my co-host, and then we have a special guest with us today, Dr. Jason Hall. I'm going to let them both say a few words. Sure. Well, I, Dr. Durst, I appreciate you having me here today. Um, mm -hmm. Really looking forward to getting into all things hormones and aesthetics. So this will be fun. We're so glad to have you. Yeah, well, thank you. And I'm a regular on here, so you guys all know me, but we're really excited to have Dr. Hall today and talk about all the things with plastic surgery and hormones and wherever else the topics may take us. So we're going to start today's podcast topic will really be, you know, surgery and hormones and how that might tie together and work um, in combination, you know, to get you lasting results and, and better outcomes and all of the things. And so as we have questions, we'll just go back and forth. And Sure. And, yeah, this will be fun. Yeah, it'll be fun. So we're going to start with like even, you know, I guess our patients being perimenopause and menopause age are frequently looking for surgical corrections of things that are um, happening. We do aesthetics, but obviously non-surgical options. And and then, but they're of an age that they're going to actually need a little bit more at times. And so what do you think you see the most of in a perimenopause, menopause age in the office? That's a great question. So about two thirds of my practice is women who are perimenopausal or menopausal. Um, and in that age range, um, there really are all comers. We see a lot of breast and body surgery. Mm -hmm. So breast lifts, breast lifts with implants, abdominoplasty, um, and then facial surgery from eyebrows and eyelids to facelifts, neck lifts, um, you know, with COVID and Zoom, the neck has become a real mm -hmm. focus. Oh, yeah, they don't um, like seeing that. No, no, nobody no. does. <laughs> nobody likes the Zoom neck. Well, Zoom can be kind of brutal, too, yeah. though, yeah. right? without yeah. a filter of some sort. Yes, yeah. exactly. A ring light. Yeah. <laughs> a ring light plus. Yeah. Um, but so, so that is the, you know, in that age range, it, uh, pretty it's much everything. top of the head to the bottom of the feet. It's everything. You know? And so that's a significant proportion though, like not something that I knew necessarily, but mm -hmm. it's, it sounds like two thirds then mm -hmm. are of an age, an older age, because well, that gives us a lot of opportunity to talk about that age range and, and different things we can do to optimize them because we don't do a lot of younger patients. It's mainly as they start to notice these symptoms. Um, when they hit the 40 and we always say 40 to 55 is that perimenopause and perimenopause is no man's land. You know, yes. you don't really know what's going on. Um, your estrogen tends to be a little high, not really high, but looks high in comparison with progesterone and testosterone, which drop. And so they tend to be, you know, a little more emotional. They're starting to notice things that they might not have noticed before. They're looking in the mirror, seeing things and body composition changes. Yeah. yeah sleep starts to not be so good, night sweats start to occur. So some of those hormonal changes, even mm -hmm. as early as 30 in some of our patients are yeah. starting to see those differences. Yeah. Out of the patients that you're seeing for surgery, about what percent do you see are on hormone therapy? Mm -hmm. Very, very few. Very actually. few, okay. And this, so this is, really, this is really exciting for me to be here and learn from the two of you because I, I do see, and we were talking before we got started, I do see a significant number of those perimenopausal and menopausal patients are on some sort of antidepressant, anti-anxiety mm -hmm. medication. And you know, from your standpoint, where do those 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 um, hormone deficiency symptoms start? And what are the kind of the most common things that you are seeing that you're treating? And so that's that's a great question because. 
I didn't realize so many weren't on hormone replacement and but I think it is an underserved like women and hormones it's they don't know really where to go and so it brings up the they've been to the gynecologist they've been to the primary care physician and basically it's an you're aging and so when you talk about medications what's the first thing that happens when they go to the gynecologist or primary they're not sleeping so they get placed on sleep medicine medications they're yeah. anxious anti-anxiety and they're a little depressed so antidepressants so we're not deficient in antidepressants or anti-anxiety medicines. We're deficient in progesterone. And you progesterone know, is our feel-good hormone. Mm-hmm. And that's usually one of the first hormones that drop as we start going through perimenopause. Mm-hmm. So, so okay. a lot of times we can just replace progesterone if we're low and balance it with estrogen. And mm-hmm. we can see sleep improve, mood improve. Balancing that estrogen can make a huge difference in these women's lives. Yeah. And again, it's really that 40 to 55. So estrogen doesn't drop. It looks high in comparison to progesterone and testosterone. And like Faraday said, progesterone is your feel-good hormone. So you can't sleep. Now, all of a sudden, you're pissed off about everything, you know, just like that. And so <laughs> Little things like, set you, you off that never we, set you off no. before. And I think that to, meme the other day was hilarious. You're like, why is the floor on the damn floor? Yeah, like, yeah. All the little things make you mad. Anything makes you mad. So like you... you I, we frequently hear, you know, we're, we're I was laid back and now all of a sudden I'm not laid back. So those are the most frequent things we see in perimenopause is um, I can't sleep. I'm anxious. You know, my mood is not the same. And that can be testosterone or progesterone, but test drops too. And so that life force for men and for women is testosterone. But it's really um, like almost a gender bias for women because mm-hmm. women and testosterone is unheard of. There's no FDA approved treatments for women in testosterone, but you can still do that. You're using bioidentical, you know, mm-hmm. which is different. So we're using maybe pellets or injectables to do testosterone. But again, it brings us to improved healing with surgery. And then again, mood's better. They're sleeping better. Yeah. You know, the inflammation Energy is going to be better. Less, or energy, all that. So. Which is huge when you're looking at body composition changes, right? If I have yeah. the energy after work to go to the gym and work out and I'm able to build muscle because my testosterone is optimized, mm-hmm. I'm going to have better composition overall. I'm going to have a better workout. I'm going to have better recovery, less inflammation. And I'm just going to feel better overall. You know, as in medicine in general, you know, bleeding, like uterine bleeding is a big thing, fibroids. And so I worked at the ER for decades. And so people would come in in that perimenopause age and they have excessive bleeding, uterine bleeding. So they have ablations and hysterectomies and all of that endometriosis is more common. And really what they need is progesterone optimization. You know, not necessarily a guarantee, but most of the time, if you have long enough period of time to oppose estrogen with progesterone, you might stop their bleeding. So we might have less surgical, you know, hysterectomies, fibroids, Mm -hmm. all of that. So so it's interesting because we don't learn that in traditional medicine. No, you don't learn anything about hormones in Mm -hmm. traditional medicine. No, At very, all. very. You, you learn the pathways, how they're made, and Correct. how they help support pregnancy, and then that's pretty much it. Correct. Yeah. No, we don't learn anything. So you really have to branch off and learn just hormone replacement to be able to do it right. So I would prefer that people send them to somebody that has hormone replacement, mm-hmm. you know, a specialty in it, because otherwise they get the wrong answers or the wrong approaches or, the or they get half estrogen. treatments. Yeah. yeah, we see that a lot. Half treatment. Well, and again, hot flashes and, and night sweats don't equal estrogen loss, but you'll actually see them placed on estrogen first, and they're already looking estrogen dominant. And so it makes it worse. So when you get the very emotional, you know, patient in that age range, it could be that too. So it's just interesting that we never learn a thing about it. It, re- it really is. And one of the things, you know, I came from a from a general surgery background first. So before plastic surgery, went through the whole five-year torture that is oh, this yeah. general surgery yeah. residency. And so one of the things we start hearing about hormone replacement one of the things that I immediately start thinking, and I know some of our colleagues in medicine start thinking about it. Probably, guess. you oh, yeah, probably guess. guess is the is the breast cancer yeah. correlation, and you know what does 
hormone replacement in a perimenopausal woman due to their breast cancer risk. Yeah. So w- t- help me with that one. All right. One well, that's interesting. And this is that's very a, common. Yeah. yeah. It gets brought up often. Well, and I think it goes back to like, so the initial um, like big scare with that was like the World Health, Health Initiative study, which was like 1993 to 2002. And it had like 16,000 women in it. And so with that, it was actually ended early when they did to a combination therapy of estrogen and progestin. So to be clear, neither of those in the study were bioidentical, which is what we do now. But, you know, even doctors don't understand bioidentical versus synthetic, synthetic. even to this day. And so I've been doing this for 12 years and it has not changed in traditional medicine. But so that study, everyone was on Primera and Provera. You remember that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. everyone was. So Provera is a synthetic progestin that is not bioidentical. And Primarin is an equine horse urine estrogen. So again, neither one of those are um, bioidentical. They're synthetic. So when they actually, they, they stopped it early for breast cancer, cardiovascular risk, and stroke. And in the study, people um, on hormone replacement actually had less in the way of colon cancer and osteoporosis, but it was the other concerns. So when they actually looked at that later on, it wasn't actually even the Premarin arm. It was the Premarin and Provera. So the progestin was actually the one that caused more issues. But again, now we're using bioidentical. And so you're using a different form. And so it's not, it doesn't cause breast cancer but it can cause a breast cancer, like an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer to grow if it's there. So screening mammograms are necessary once we reach menopause and are replacing Mm -hmm. estrogen. We're not to a point where we're actually using estrogen and breast cancer or even breast cancer treatment survivor patients. So we're not doing that at all. But just like estrogen, you would think that if estrogen caused it, everyone when they're pregnant and younger would get breast cancer. But it's the same thing. If they get it, it's genetic predisposition. So if they get it, they block estrogen production. And so we won't place somebody on estrogen if they have it. So we do require screening mammograms, but it doesn't cause. And it's kind of similar to men. Mm -hmm. Like everyone made it seem like testosterone caused prostate cancer. There's a good book out called testosterone for life and Morgenthaler is a urologist from Harvard that wrote the book and basically has you know critically multiple studies critically looked at all the (laughs) studies that suggested it and it doesn't cause um, prostate cancer either but it can cause it to grow if it's there and so because again I think common sense would tell us it's not the case you know because if estrogen caused breast cancer or if testosterone caused prostate cancer Men and women would have it at a very young age, but it always happens at an older age. So logically it made sense. But I think that huge study scared everyone. And at the time you were probably, I don't know where you were. I was in, I was in finishing medical school. Yeah. So, and and everyone was being taken off of Mm -hmm. hormones. And so, um, I mean, 50% of people were taken off hormones with that. But then after they evaluated later on, it really was the progestin part. And now anything related to bioidentical has no correlation with breast cancer at okay. all. That's, that's another question that I have is, you know, in doing some preparatory work for mm-hmm. this, is that the bioidentical designation is, is tossed around a lot. And it's not something that I, until I started reading about it, understood. And I think a lot of patients, certainly mm-hmm. if, if I start recommending, you know, if and when I start recommending patients mm-hmm. seeing somebody for hormone replacement, what does that bioidentical designation actually mean? So it's actually very interesting because it is yeah. like it's a term that I think it's even interchanged people- so much in medicine inappropriately. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think it is a keyword that has become... A little popular, you know, like it's a fad, this bioidentical, but really when we look at bioidentical hormones, the body is recognizing it as it, as its own and utilizing it as its own instead of seeing that synthetic arm. So it is a big difference between pharmaceutical companies making a chemical compound to try to mimic the body versus taking something natural like from yams and having the same components the body can actually see it and utilize it as if it is our own production. 
And again, so they're synthetic in that they're made and not obtained from someone. So I think that's one of the big confusing points because it's still made, but it's identical to the body's own hormone. So estradiol is the one we're replacing. So there's three estrogens, you know, estriol, estradiol, and um, estrone. And estrone. So estrone is a very weak one. Nobody uses, but it's postmenopausal and weak. Estradiol is the one that's premenopausal and strong and preventative. So preventative for bone, brain, heart stuff, but it's E2, estradiol. It's identical to the estradiol that we produce in our body. So for simplicity terms, no matter what term is used, I think there's other things like bioact, bioidentical, bio, um, like um, organic, like there's all kinds of different terms, but we're measuring hormones before, we're replacing and we're measuring after. So a drug or Premarin, for instance, which was a synthetic, we could not test in the blood. So we can do an E2 level baseline, treat, and then do an E2 level and see where we're at. So it's identical to the E2 of the body. And progesterone bioidentical micronized is also identical to progesterone. So they don't add like a small chemical component that's close and mimics, but it's identical. So the testing that you're doing is very similar to, say, testing vitamin levels. Mm -hmm. If you like vitamin D has been all over the news in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. you're, you replace vitamin D with vi vitamin D3 with vitamin D3. And then you check vitamin D3 li later and Correct. see where you are. Correct. Like that's a perfect way exactly. to, to, I think, make it simple for people to understand because there's lots of terms used. And I think the synthetic component, the fact that it is synthetic. So there are like stem cells or exosomes and things that are obtained from live births and used. This is not. And so I think the fact that it's made from something confuses people, but it's identical. Mm. And you're right. It's just like vitamins. If they get vitamins at the vitamin store, they're identical, Yeah, you know, and they're made, but you can test them and get levels. Yes. And in my, I, I think I heard you, you, you tried to, I think you tried to slip something in there made from <laughs> yams. So the, oh, these are all, yeah. these are all plant-based. <laughs> A lot of times. For the, yeah. for the, for the most yeah. part. Okay. Absolutely. That's, that's totally cool. Yeah. 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 And I think that versus taking from Horses. Horse yes. urine. Which we yeah. should not yeah. be doing, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> and then I think that for patients, they very much understand we're testing, we're replacing, we're testing. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're going to know what your level is. There's lots of things thrown around and we won't get much into it, but like you can do salivary testing versus blood. But blood is very easily recognized by physicians. You can communicate with other physicians. And so salivary tends to be more of like either an academic term used or people that can't actually order, like providers that can't order blood, you know, mm -hmm. testing. So they'll do salivary mm -hmm. testing. So, and, and other like Dr. Gere said, it's harder when you're working in a community with multiple physicians, right? We want a good relationship with primary. We want a good relationship with endocrine, with the urologist. So blood serum is universal. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The test in front of me, you're going to understand that test in front of you. The Salivary testing is very complex sometimes. And you look at it and you're like, okay, the measurement is way different. The ranges are way different. So they're not as universally yeah. understood. So it makes it a little bit harder when we're partnering in our Very, community. very hard. Interesting. Like even after 12 years of doing this, I don't <laughs> still, so, yeah. I'm still thinking about it. I'm still, 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 still learning, the, learning yeah. the, the salivary uh, testing yeah. part of it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's not a part of the the practice that that we do at no, all. So no, so it's it's good, like blood and communication, and again, you know, finding surgeons, urologists, GYN docs that are like not going to scare patients too, you know, because some of them don't understand, but it's better to not understand and refer on than to scare. So we have some primary mm -hmm. care doctors that'll be like, again, I thought maybe you were going to say clots. Mm -hmm. because that's the second thing. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure that that comes up all the time. That was, you. that was with surgery. That was going to be my next that question. Was your yeah. I knew you were going there, <laughs> yeah. right? All I right. knew it was like yeah. breast cancer or clot. I wasn't yeah. sure which one was coming yeah. first. Well, yeah, but we knew they were both right. coming. Yeah. 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 You, you were expecting them both. Yeah. Well, and with you, like with breast surgeries, this is actually a good question for us to know is, is do, 
screening mammograms and like breast surgery or if they're on hormones because not many of your patients are on hormones mm -hmm. but do you uh -huh. is a screening mammogram required for like a breast surgery it is if you are over 40 or are high risk i i tend to use the the current um breast society guidelines to to drive that um so in and we've had women i had a lady, um, very nice lady, was coming in for a breast surgery about six months ago um, and hadn't been screened. She was in her mid 40s mm -hmm. um, and we ended up finding a breast tumor on, okay. a, on a screening, asymptomatic mm -hmm. on a screening mammogram mm -hmm. and had to delay her surgery so that she could have her breast cancer treated. Okay. Um, and so it's with, with specializing in surgery, nobody really needs that mm -hmm. they want. Yes. Um, yeah. It's those those kind of safety measures are really important. That you know we'll, we can talk about clots and risk assessment for mm -hmm. that and and anticoagulation, but all of that stuff is really important. So yeah. long long answer to what should have been yeah. what's a short question is yeah the, the screening mammogram for the over forty or high risk population. So is, based on like pretty mm -hmm. standardized based on guidelines. Mm -hmm. Then mm, what yeah. about your patients that are on hormones? Do you have them hold their hormones or stop their hormones pre surgery? That really that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a good answer for you because the number of patients who are on bioidentical hormones before surgery is so low. I have to actually go look up recommendations every time I see one. Okay. So it's a it's a very and I, I would love to get y'all's input on how to make that more, process yeah. more um, you know data driven and safe for those patients. What should we do? What's Absolutely. actually interesting because yeah. yeah. we we did a lot of look looking into that even prior to this podcast, kind of to see if there's like any good science studies that have solid recommendations and there's not a lot out there, I will say. And like one said, like, I think 42% of like bioidentical companies would recommend stopping that four weeks to three months before. And I think that's probably a common time frame that you've heard. Or four and to then, six weeks. Yeah, and then it was that like a 24% mm -hmm. of synthetic or OCPs, like birth control, mm -hmm. um, that same time frame, but only like 3% of surgeons doing it. Yeah. And that was about the most solid study we found. But having said that, like estrogen is the hormone you're concerned with when it comes to clots. Progesterone and testosterone have nothing to do with it. You probably won't have many patients on testosterone because it's not commonly used with women. And I'm assuming that the practice is mainly women. Probably a small Most, amount but, of men. But, 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 yeah. but 98% yeah, women. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. I, I mean, I was to guess that it was mainly. And so testosterone isn't used a ton with women. And we'll talk about that because it should be. It's awesome for yeah. healing purposes. But um, estrogen is the only one. So if anything is given orally, I'll just make it simple from my standpoint, and I couldn't find anything to back it up or not back it up, is oral estrogen goes to the liver, increases clotting factors, and increases your risk. So birth control, oral estrogen, estradiol, which is a manufactured brand that the primary doctors are more likely to use than us. And GYN. Yep. And we mm -hmm. never use oral, ever, because oral estrogen, mm -hmm. because it increases clotting and clotting factors so ours is all either transdermal or pellets okay and so i think if you're looking at bioidentical transdermal or pellets you don't need to stop it and if you're looking at oral estrogens then it sounds like there's some guidelines out there and it's like four weeks to three months mm -hmm. but no one's really and, you routinely following them and we were seeing a lot online where it was saying um when we were looking trying to find solid studies that if it's transdermal estrogen you don't have to stop it mm -hmm. so gel spray patch no need, just oral. Mm -hmm. So it's, like Dr. Durst said, it's very swayed. You know, it's yeah. kind of for every three studies we could find one way, we could find three on the other hand as well. But there was across the board, micronized progesterone, no need to stop, no worry about any clotting. And then with testosterone, as long as we're watching hemoglobin hematocrit and mm -hmm. blood levels are normalized, mm -hmm. there's no Good reason to yeah. come off. Yeah. Yeah, and, and with, with us, you know, for... Anybody who's actually having surgery, you know, we use a clotting risk assessment before that's a standardized, gotcha. you know, okay. a standardized yes. protocol with that assigns point values to every single one of those things. And 
you know, oral contraception, oral hormone replacement is one of the line items okay. on there. And once you get to a certain point, it kind of tips you over into a, a risk category that you need um, IV or subcutaneous anticoagulation before surgery to prevent those clots because those clots are going to form in, you know, essentially on induction of anesthesia mm -hmm. um, is when you're going to get that clot started. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, other things, the, the way we provide anesthesia, the level of relaxation that the patient has, and then they're, you know, them laying around after surgery, all, mm -hmm. all of those things kind of affect that Yes. Clotting I, pathway. I love scoring <laughs> systems for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. kind of lays awesome. it out and, yeah. and it makes it more objective. standard. Every, yeah. Everybody yeah. can do it. Very everybody easy. can score it. Yeah, you just got to go down. But yeah, and I think that that makes sense that if oral, you know, estrogens or birth control are on there, that would make mm -hmm. sense completely. Especially with clotting factor history, family mm -hmm. history, if you've had a previous clot, things like that that make you at high risk, yeah. of course, yeah. it makes sense to hold. And again, for us, even treating um, patients with clotting history, you know, it comes down to because they come into us the same way. Mm -hmm. We have a clotting history, I can't be on it, which isn't necessarily true, but it depends on, you know, if it's a DVT post-flight flight, you know, you're on an airplane, then there's a risk factor. And if we didn't use oral, you could. So it just depends. So same thing you know, that risk stratification with it. But we could go on forever about hormones and surgery and effects. So I think what's interesting to me is to see if you have a difference or have noticed, observed a difference in women of different ages. And again, because most of the patients are women, um, not that I was, you know, just pointing out women, but um, in healing times after surgery, like do younger do better, do older um, tend to have more complications? What or just comorbidities. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's an interesting question. I actually just um, was just talking about this the other day that in cosmetic plastic surgery, age really isn't a factor as much as or chronological age. So how, how many years, you know, for those of you, how many years old you are is less of a factor than physically how old you are. Mm -hmm. And when, with what I do, most of that is soft tissue is, you know, just for example, when talking about breast surgery, is the breast tissue dense and firm like a youthful breast or has it been, mm -hmm. has it atrophied and gotten replaced with fatty tissue, which is, you know, less, um, mm -hmm. has less, um, less pliability to it. Less yeah. Firm, less elasticity. <laughs> you know, the, that, yeah. the ligaments that support the breast stretch out with pregnancy and mm -hmm. it, can those still support a breast? What's it, is the skin thin with stretch marks or is it nice and thick and elastic? Mm -hmm. And that's where I, I'm interested to hear from you is how hormone replacement can help that because yeah. certainly with thin tissue, with, atrophic breast tissue with stretched out suspensory ligaments, you know, that breast lift with implants isn't going to be as durable as it is if that tissue is really healthy. Supple. Yeah. 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 When I think when it comes down to like hormone optimization, it's cell health. And so even what you're talking about is just how healthy is that cell. And so, you know, collagen elastin are like a huge component in a lot of skin aging or mm -hmm. soft tissue aging because yeah. we're talking about yeah. both. Um, Again, biologic age, skin aging. So if they're down, I always say like if they're going to lose one percent of collagen a year. So if some like that's a gross, you know, estimate. So if somebody comes in at fifty, and they've done nothing to stimulate collagen, they're fifty percent down. And so it's easy to talk to them about ways to stimulate collagen and elastin in addition to just like I want Botox, I want fillers, because we can control movement, right? We can fill a little bit, but you're not going to get everything that you want in just filling and Botox. You can at 20, you know, 30, but not once we're older, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I think that when we talk about effects of hormones on collagen production, there's lots of stuff there. Testosterone's got a huge, you know, amount of literature on healing and even collagen production and tensile strength of collagen once it's there. You know, estrogen, 
estrogen is a huge one. Yeah. There was just an article yeah. in Dermatology Times talking about as estrogen starts to deplete, we start losing that collagen. We start having those mm-hmm. histolo- histological changes in the skin. Mm-hmm. We see IGF-1 go down. I mean, it's pretty interesting that we can see that how much of a big effect estrogen can have in overall skin health and starting estrogen in women when they need versus waiting until they're 10 years postmenopausal, mm-hmm. starting when they're losing that estrogen, helping that skin stay supple, uh, preventing those changes. Mm-hmm. So, well, and not just skin, right? Soft tissue is what you're talking exactly. about. So everybody thinks of skin, and so that's just a very superficial aspect of it. But fat, per, you know, pat, fat perfusion is like a huge thing with estrogen. Mm-hmm. So just getting healthier fat, if there is, you know, such a thing, which there is, oh, yeah, like absolutely. there's a, a, a level of subcutaneous fat that is needed. And again, beyond that, it becomes less of just a storage unit and more of an endocrine. So you get negative effects mm-hmm. if you get too much. So obesity and body contouring and liposuction has great mm-hmm. endocrine effects on the body too, because now you don't have fat producing bad things because you've taken some of the fat out. And then I think their mood also improves. So they're also motivated. But again, fat um, effects of estrogen matter too, because you're gonna have healthier fat. Mm -hmm. So in the breast tissue, that's one thing. And then test is another one. Progesterone has a little bit, but less in the way of skin and soft tissue and muscle in healing and anti-inflammatory effects as estrogen and testosterone do. So now help me out because I, you know, I do a lot of, you know, about half of my practice is facial surgery. Mm -hmm. And in that, a lot of patients come in and want to know how to improve their skin, lines and wrinkles, texture. And I end up recommending for a lot of those patients, some form of laser resurfacing. Absolutely. It's great. There is, you know, there are, are kind of old reports about estrogen replacement and and skin healing. How can I help those patients? And have you seen patients who have gotten better results from resurfacing procedures that are on testosterone replacement versus patients who are not? Absolutely. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I always say, like again, I mean, to me, it's all about like behind the scenes too. Yeah. So, like we're doing a lot of stuff to treat something we're seeing. So as we age, we all notice things in the mirror that we don't want to see, we didn't see before. And I think one thing leads to another. So you correct one, you see something different. I mean, women don't want to chase lines. We tell women that all the time. Do not chase the lines. Yeah. With (laughs) with filler. So, (laughs) you know, that doesn't make any sense, right? So we're just filling a line, but you're not getting at the underlying cause. So I think laser resurfacing, number one, is an awesome like addition to everything else. So you can, that's a finishing, right? You're finishing, like you're making everything thicker, the entire skin surface thicker, depending on what layers yeah. you're using. And, um, and, but then behind the scenes is the cell health. So like, I think if you're perimenopause and you're menopausal, you're not going to get sustained results unless your cell is completely healthy. So you're, your nutrition's good. Your sleep is good. You know, your you're not dehydrated. Your biological <laughs> skin <laughs> health is, is, is younger, you know, so already you're going to get better results. But estrogen, like again, that glow of pregnancy, the vascular, you know, supply to the skin is huge. And so that's why we start to lose elasticity and collagen as we get older, because the estrogen, you know, and the blood flow to the skin is less, but testosterone has a huge effect on that too. You know, just mm-hmm. you're supporting bone growth because facial aging, you know, more than us, and we would love to hear more about it, you know, the fat pads and bone, you know, they get less support, Mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why you get all the sagging. Yeah. And with decreased estrogen and testosterone, you lose bone. Yeah. So what do you notice with that? Like, and I think that, like, our ladies would love to hear more of that, the change in the facial structure as they age related to, you know, bone and fat pads? Sure. Yeah. There, there, there have been, um, and I, I talk about this almost every consultation that the face ages in a relatively predictable way. You know, we all experience the same changes over time. Um, the interesting thing is that I've never really thought to link that to hormone fluctuations versus mm-hmm. just time, but I, mm-hmm. I, the two probably go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and most notably in women, you'd kind of mentioned bone aging. Um, we all lose 
volume in our facial skeleton over time, which contributes to the hollow eyes, the under eye bags, Thinning jowling, yeah. you know, the, the both jowling in the front, loss of the kind of the angle mm-hmm. of your mandible, because the bony skeleton actually recedes around the eye sockets, recedes around the jaw. And people talk about their nose getting bigger over time. Mm. That's actually from the skeleton Recession. getting smaller. Yeah. Is, mm-hmm. is the nose doesn't actually change. The skeleton gets smaller. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of, you know, we can't really do a whole lot about bone replacement. So we end up camouflaging that with either deep soft tissue fillers, which can offer modest improvement mm-hmm. in that early patient with those early signs mm-hmm. of aging, and then your own body fat. Um, doing actually taking fat, fat grafting, doing actually. fat grafting, taking fat with syringe liposuction, processing that out very similar to, you know, we had talked about stem cells earlier, mm-hmm. very similar to some of the processing that's done for that, and then re-injecting those into those areas. Um, the An interesting thing about that is that there was some work that just came out of San Diego earlier this year that showed that there's a cutoff at about 55 years old. And if you're younger than 55, and this is these are patients that are primarily women, if you're younger than 55, you have about an 80 to 90 percent take. So 80 to 90 percent of what we inject stays at a year and a half. If you're over 55, that number drops to 50 percent or less. Have you ever that's looked at PRP addition to like some of the fat? Because I know that's mm-hmm. a new kind of area mm-hmm. that is intriguing. I've just touched on like a couple and a lot of times it's our patients bringing something to us mm-hmm. like because we do prp but don't mm-hmm. do fat transfer so yeah. they'll come to us and ask and so just briefly looked at but yeah it, and it's something that has started to kind of catch on in in the plastic surgery world but right now looking at the data the take is not astronomically different. You okay. get a little bit more, but not. it's not the difference between 30% take and a 90% You're not take. taking okay. your 55-year-olds and now they're all responding. And now they're right. not all right. 80, 90%. Right. It's not that. Un- <laughs> unfortunately, not yet. Yeah. Not yet. You're not improving it to, yeah, 95 with with that age, uh, that age uh, group. But anyhow, I think that it's interesting that you say, so what I'm hearing, again, obviously the bone decreases. You can't do anything about that. Mm-hmm. So you have skeleton shrinkage with time Mm -hmm. and so everything starts to sag you know and the gravity is you know is pulling it down you can't do anything about that um you know surgically uh but fat you can so you can take it from somewhere else Mm -hmm. because that's something that's also um getting heavier with time moves to the lower face away from the upper face and are you usually pairing that at the same time you're doing deep dermal are they two separate? Just out of curiosity, because we have patients that are, we're realistic with our patients. We have women yeah. sometimes that come in and they're like, I want this. And I'm like, well, that's a facelift. Yeah. Yes. That, yeah. We're, you're not going to get that from filler. You're not going to get that from do. threads. Yeah. You're not going to get that from laser resurfacing or microneedling. It's just not realistic. Mm-hmm. So they'll ask, you know, well, what does that look like? You know, mm-hmm. so out of curiosity, do you do them at the same time? Are you doing dermal fillers and also fat transfers, that, that grafting or... It, with with that, I'm doing pretty much either or. Okay. Um, the, and the, the conversation in my office is, it, you know, we talk about, and I've talked about this on, on a podcast episode in the past, is that there are really three different areas of facial aging that you have to address to get a comprehensive treatment. You've got to address the skin. You've got to address the volume loss. And we got I got kind of carried away with the bony part and forgot about the fat pads. Mm-hmm. Um but the you know the, your facial you've got a bunch of little facial fat compartments mm-hmm. that all lose most of them lose volume over time. Some of them, kind of the ones right around your nasal labia crease, the lower ones tend, <laughs> tend, 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 tend to grow, which we yes. don't want. Um, but trying to refill some of those areas with either filler or fat is one of the one of the pillars of facial aging that we mm-hmm. try and reverse. You can do some of that with fillers, mm-hmm. but the the cost lines tend to cross fairly okay. soon. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're talking about, you know, eight, nine, ten syringes of filler mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to hit all of these different areas versus a single session of fat grafting with 
the possibility of coming back at a year and adding a little bit more to select areas. Um, and then that the third part of the, the kind of the facial aging triad is the is the structural part, kind of the part that gravity takes over mm-hmm. the bone, um, all of the muscles supporting your face, and that you know facelift surgery, necklift surgery is really muscle tightening. There's, there's no, the skin kind of comes along for the ride. Yeah. Um, and so that part of it is is where, and once you start seeing jowling, um, once you start seeing neck laxity, you know, those are things that you may get a very, very slight improvement with revolumizing, but without looking alien, it's yeah. tough to fix that. <laughs> yes. And, and we have those conversations a lot in this office too oh, yeah. about yeah. that, you know, we yeah. don't do overdone. Yeah. Well, and I think that again, filler gets a bad rap for that reason because you're trying to do it beyond the point where you need to. Mm-hmm. And so they're not very realistic. And so we have that because people don't want filler at all. But you're like, what do you mean? Like your it. point, because yeah. I almost look at it as like a firm fill and finish. Like, that firming is what you're talking about, like where they need left. Mm -hmm. And so you need more, you can fill and do some volume replacement, and then you can finish with all the, you know, Botox and laser resurfacing and all that. But again, it looks abnormal and gets a bad rap because people are overdoing it, trying to fix everything. And that's Mm -hmm. impossible. Then you're going to distort movement. You're going to look abnormal. Alien is a good term. Alien is yeah. a really good yeah. term. Yeah. Yeah. I That's like that. That's a good term. So yeah. <laughs> you know the and the the you don't want to don't want to hit the uh, hit the injectable companies too hard, but they've developed some of these stronger fillers. Your your um, Voluma. Some of these some of these fillers that are really stiff. And they say, well, this will give you a lot of lift. If you just put it all up in here, you can get rid of that jowl. And so you start seeing people that are e- whose faces are either totally square or they've got these very exaggerated cheekbones. Cheeks bones. are quite they're, impressive. They're, yes. their, jowls, their jowls have gotten a little better, though. Well, yeah, I mean, you've it's lifted. the jowls a little better. Yeah. You've lifted everything. Yeah. You've like, lifted everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but if you look at, so I've seen a couple, and I should have brought a um, filler on, but if you squeeze it out, like, so for the G prime, you know, all of that, like, again, if I squeeze it onto my finger and press down, it's going to move, Yeah. you know, so it's not like it's as firm as they try to make it seem, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to still make it move. And so it's not a correction. Yeah. 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 And I like using those, uh, not, mm-hmm. not to, no. not to throw those, those guys under the bus. Those, I think those stiffer fillers have a good have mm-hmm. a role in in facial rejuvenation. Absolutely. I like using them to contour the areas of bone loss mm, and then absolutely. use some of those softer mm-hmm. fillers to go in and fill fat pads and and try and yes. you know I like your I liked your firm fill and finish is is there yeah. If they start talking about, you know, lifting in some way <clears throat> then it's different, but you can volume loss and you yeah. know, and fill, and you can finishing. Everyone needs. Yeah. So we have those that laser yeah. Yeah. resurfacing you were talking about. Yeah. Everybody benefits from yeah. that. Yeah. Young to old. Yeah. Yeah, and laser resurfacing is the key to that, like completely, one hundred percent. Yeah. And again, it depends on which one, and it depends on downtime and what they want. But still, you got to have laser resurfacing as well. Oh, I, I couldn't agree. It, it, yeah. it has yeah. it has become over time has become one of my favorite Mm -hmm. facial Mm -hmm. rejuvenation Mm -hmm. uh, modalities is just finding the person that is that the patient that matching the patient to the result to the downtime yeah oh yeah absolutely and we have that again we don't we just don't talk about resurfacing enough and i love lasers for that reason because you can do so much with them and you still need that because that's your finishing Mm-hmm. Like your finishing touches, you still don't want wrinkles and you want thick skin and you want it to look healthy and vibrant. And so you tell our patients you should be doing something every month, every yeah. month, every month. So we do memberships for laser resurfacing for our patients um, and that they love. They get to come in once a month and they've got a variety of things they can choose from. And it makes a huge difference overall. Mm-hmm. What, what, what do you like? What's your favorite? For laser resurfacing? Oh, right now, mine's yeah. the triple glow, which is um, where we'll dermaplane, do a hydrofacial, and then we use the Lutronic um, Ultra Glow just over. So it kind of, it does a little bit of everything. Cleans out the pores. It makes me not fuzzy. And then just that light few top layers of skin off. I just 
a huge, huge, huge difference in my skin since I've been doing that. So I think that that's a good like maintenance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a good maintenance Pores, one, but you're not going to really yeah. treat. And I look at them at, as different. So you're yeah. treating or you're just maintaining or mm -hmm. preventing. Yeah. And so that's a prevention one. So on a monthly basis, it's almost this prevention. Like you need to do something once a month. But so when it comes to like treatment in here, we do one of two mainly. And we don't do, we have like, we don't have a CO2, but we have an erbium that can go superficial or deep. So depending mm -hmm. on their downtime, it also does like a 4D, what we call 4D non-surgical facelift mm -hmm. because it's, we go into the mouth with it. It's a different type of laser. Oh, wow. Um, and Fatone is the name of the laser, which is mm -hmm. like one of my favorites. It's a beast um, of a machine. A but you can go in the mouth and do deep dermal where, you know, all therapy before you can yeah. get as deep. So at least you can thicken everything. So you can go in the mouth, you know, so you're getting the nasal labial folds around the mouth. And wow. then you come to the outside for two other steps for a mid and upper dermis. Mm -hmm. And then resurfacing. And that resurfacing is an erbium that usually is ablative, but you can actually do it in non-ablative mode, or you can take it really deep with downtime. Not probably quite the results that you would get with CO2, but we could, but none of our patients want. They're not coming to us because they are looking for downtime, really. Mm -hmm. So I think if they're looking for surgery or they're looking for you know, something more aggressive, like a one-time, maybe a two-time, but usually one-time, because CO2, is that one of your favorites? So or? I, I have a I have an Erbium YAG. Um, okay. So it, it is, it's interesting because we have an attachment that does the a combination fractional ablative and deeper non-ablative. But then most of the, most of that, you know, device is ablative, okay, either fractional okay. or full field. Okay. Um, so want to get back to what you were saying about the, the photon that was that like in the mouth is kind of cool that so that's a non-ablative so it's very laser. interesting so what you're saying too even with those final steps so photona has two wavelengths so it's a 2940 okay. rpm and then it's a 1064 okay and diag and mm -hmm. so the first one is erbium but mm -hmm. it's an erbium with a long pulse wave so like with or with the long wavelength. And mm -hmm. so with that, you can get deep, but not ablative. So you can heat. So you can go in the mm -hmm. mouth and obviously Erbium is attracted to water. So you can basically laser inside the mouth and get deeper to thicken the deep dermal. The outside next two steps are actually in DIAG. And so you get a little deeper, a little more superficial with almost something similar to a frac, but in DIAG mm -hmm. targets pigment. Yeah. And so you really don't want to do that with men, but then you come to the last step and it's erbium again. So you can do, you know, your deeper non-ablative, mm -hmm. you can do fractional full, you know, full, um, full field if you wanted to. So it depends on their downtime. So yeah. you can go deep and, but the nice thing about this one is like, you can dial it deeper or more superficial in any of the modes, but it does like 170 other treatments. So mm -hmm. we can do vaginal rejuvenation. We do like a 4V vaginal facelift, like with the laser. So similar to the face, but on mm -hmm. the vagina, on the outside for, so with some pretty amazing results. For somebody, oh, absolutely. Just, you for somebody that isn't like a surgical <laughs> yeah. candidate, yeah. you know, but didn't even think about making it prettier, but they can make it pretty. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, that, that's <laughs> actually, you, you, you jumped the, you, you jumped me there on that <laughs> yeah. one because I was going to ask you about that because we were, when we were walking through earlier, um, you had talked about the the vaginal rejuvenation laser, and that's not something that I do. And we've, I, I think we've all seen an uptick in mm -hmm. cosmetic oh, general procedures in the last couple of years. You know, labiaplasty has become a really popular surgical procedure, but the non-surgical vaginal rejuvenation is not something that I have a whole lot of familiarity with other than the devices are out there. So educate me on what mm -hmm. that is. Yes. It is unbelievable. When these ladies came back last year from Texas and were like, we can do a 4D on the vagina. I was like, what? I'm like, no way. Yeah. <laughs> and our first patient that jumped on the table, we were blown away. Just one treatment, the tightening external that we saw was yeah. just remarkable. Mm -hmm. She came back seven, eight months later and there was no change. No laxity. She wow. was just as firm as she was when she left after that first treatment. And usually we're doing about three of them because mm -hmm. we want to maintain. But it has 
it is unbelievable the changes that we're seeing. Um, we had a patient recently that came in um, that has done labioplasty before and is still seeing some changes now a few years mm -hmm. later. And we're trying to target some of those areas and we're being able to correct that laxity and just it's blown me away. So most of them are like non-surgical candidates for the outside. So they're not even really thinking about it necessarily. And, mm -hmm. to, and we didn't even think about it. Like, honestly, I did ER for decades. I tell this story all the time pelvic exams nonstop, right? Never looked at a vagina and thought that needs to be prettier. I just thought right. that needs to be like, they're all different. They're right? all different. You know, that's yeah. it. And so the first one we did last year, I was shocked at the results. She was like pacing in front hour. of my door, waiting for me to yeah. come out just yeah. to show me the picture. Yeah. So it's pretty amazing. We'll show you that. It, um, but then the inside though, so those are all non-surgical. And I think we're bringing that to to light just because people are more aware. So if we're talking to them about internal vaginal rejuvenation, then we're naturally just talking to them about external, but they're not anyone that's ever been told they needed a labioplasty. I mean, those patients that come to you for labioplasty, you're probably kind of told and directed, you know, to come in because the gynecologist or someone else it's not usually the patients, is it, that has noticed a big change? Or they have like pinching, right? Yeah. Just excessive skin. Yeah. So it, we're not it, seeing those patients. Yeah, it's it's the um, yoga pants, tight swimsuits, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. that Instagram and the internet, um, not a lot, uh, surprisingly not a lot of physician referrals. For that it's okay. a, it's a lot of self referral. Well, I wonder. I just saw that system. article about the yoga pants, and one physician had like a crazy increase in well, labia yeah. plastic yeah. thanks to yeah, La double surgical to the labia yoga plastic. pants yeah. in twenty twenty two. They did yeah. so. Yeah, that's interesting. And I figured maybe if anything, like somebody had told them, like gyne gynecology wise, like you know, this is surgical if they were bothered by it. But yeah, I think that with Instagram and social media, clearly women are more aware of what they look like versus what others. And again, if pornography has become more pronounced, even, or pronounced in a yeah. younger generation, then it's going to only increase, right? Yeah. But I think sure. women are sitting around and talking a lot more about this kind of stuff too. Like my mom wasn't talking to her girlfriends about what her vagina looked like, or if she's ever done any treatment or thought about it, you know, that I think it's changing as we are all sitting around, we're talking about it. There's more just oh. openness about mm -hmm. it. It's well, not as taboo it, to talk it's a about sexual these different things. Girl. Like it's yeah. down, down, but it's gonna it's one without borders this time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know? It has no borders. Yeah. It's open. So I think that's the big issue is and again, I think that they're noticing others. And then under 18, I think it was like a five percent of labioplasties done. Mm -hmm. Which is crazy. 18. Is that yeah, it's, it's, reasonable? I, I th I'm what seeing, you know, older teenagers. Um, okay. I, I can't say that I've seen somebody under 18 yet, okay. but certainly early college age, 19, 20, 21. Okay. I'm learning a ton about uh, genital <laughs> cosmetic <laughs> surgery today. Yeah, this is this is awesome. But vaginal aesthetics, yeah. like we call it vaginal, vaginal rejuvenation. Vaginal vagina. Vagina. <laughs> from Tennessee, just so you know. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So the the you know external labioplasty is something you know we do a lot of and are doing more of all the mm -hmm. time. What do what do women who are looking for internal Reju vaginal rejuvenation. What are the symptoms that bring them in, and then how do the how does the laser help with that? So it's interesting because like the hormones and the sexual vaginal rejuvenation they kind cross, of cross over, a lot. over a lot because so if somebody comes in with hormone complaints, like the whole list of questions also goes through yeah. a lot of sexual questions. You know, vaginal dryness, pain, orgasms, whether it's clitoral, whether it's vaginal. So you know, even what their drive is, you know, all of that because they cross over. So if they're coming with hormone complaints, we're almost talking to them about sexual wellness too. And if they come with sexual wellness, again, we've already talked, talked to them about, about that cell optimization. So if they want, you know, vaginal rejuvenation, you know, we talked to them about like how to optimize again, results and lasting results. So they tend to complain of urinary incontinence. So a lot of them have had children you know, yeah. so just the weight of the pregnancy obliterates like the support of the Color urethra. Four. So that's our urinary younger women. incontinence, urinary incontinence, and vaginal laxity, yep, laxity from pregnancy. decreased orgasmic strength is a huge one in perimenopause and menopause. And so it's going to go down with time. 
men and women both have changes with time, different changes. Absolutely. And so vaginal dryness, pain, pain with, with sex, intercourse, all yeah. of that. So, um, so really laxity, urinary incontinence, pain, vaginal dryness, and orgasmic changes. Those are the big things that they're complaining about. And it depends on the age, depends on the patient. Absolutely. You know, if they're young, mm-hmm. they've had one pregnancy, they don't tolerate urinary incontinence anymore. Like it's mm-hmm. unacceptable to, you know, accept something as part of the process, mm-hmm. like childbearing. It's yeah. crazy mm-hmm. how many women come in and they say, well, my doctor just told me to wear a pad for my stress incontinence. I'm like, what? Why, yeah. why is that a solution? Mm-hmm. Just wear a pad or an adult diaper. So we'll get a lot of... At, at, at 35 you, years old? I mean, right? <laughs> You'd yeah. be surprised. Yeah. You're kidding. How many women are like, my, my doctor told me to wear a liner, a pad. I'm like, what? <laughs> like that blows my mind that women wow. are being told that. And we looked at a study not that long ago, and that was the number one. Like 80%. Yeah, like 80% of physicians are recommending adult diapers or pads. As for urinary incontinence. For stress urinary incontinence, 80%. And that, that was, was the like top recommendation. 2019, like it wasn't that long ago that Mm-mm. it was that survey. It blew our mind. We're like, that is the most ridiculous thing when there are so many options out there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's it, you brought up urinary incontinence. One of the things that we do that kind of has the side effect of helping stress incontinence is a tummy tuck, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you're you're part of that stress that incontinence complex. is yeah is is a loss of you know abdominal pressure from you know increase in domain so the fascia mm-hmm. the muscle layers stretch out and so by that. fixing. You know your your Holding rectus or your together. six pack muscles, you increase that pressure and can help for mild urine incontinence can treat it. Wow, See. I didn't so, even think about I that. I didn't either. We yeah. talk a lot about platelet rich plasma, mm-hmm. the O shot. We yeah. talk a lot about radio frequency. Um, so we do Votiva mm-hmm. for. And we talk about microneedling internal um, and external. So that's one thing we've never really. That's ever yeah. crossed my yeah. mind for women. Yeah. We even talk about uh, Kegels, right? So yeah. there's lasers out there to help do a HIIT workout for your vagina with yeah. electromuscular <laughs> sk- yeah. stimulation. I mean, there's all kinds of things out there. We have probably a full suite of things for women's health, but that's one thing I've never really yeah. thought of for them to address. Yeah. I didn't know that. I was almost thinking it would lift overall, but you're you're talking about you're containing. It's, and yeah. so it's going to improve all of that. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a pressure. Yeah. It's a pressure. <laughs> Yeah. Solution. And I almost want to get on into that um, abdominal, you know, abdominal, um, abdominal plastic or, or surgical mm-hmm. options, but also even body contouring. But I don't want to take away from the sexual just yet, because <laughs> it's interesting because people come to us with like a weight loss issue or, a, you know, an issue that needs more than just body contouring and body contouring is awesome. Mm-hmm. But there's a, an extent you know, oh, yeah. it's beyond sure. a level sometimes and they need surgical. And we could talk about that, too, because I'm always very realistic. We are here. You know, you can spend a lot of money doing body contouring. But if it's a circumferential, you know, thing and it's like, a you know, skin excess, you know, it's not well, something. We're yeah. not yeah. fixing yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And and skin, it, skin excess and skin laxity. You know, mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're seeing that patient, that mm-hmm. hormone deficient patient with poor collagen and just floppy skin, even if it doesn't look like they've got a lot of excess, I see a ton of unhappy patients from cool sculpting or whatever. Oh, yeah. the, oh, we the, see a lot. You know, non-surgical yeah. body contouring mm-hmm. where they're not like you are, where you're looking at the skin and, the, and kind of making that assessment, but just saying, oh yeah, toss them on the machine and we'll get rid of some of that fat. And then they end up either with no change or looking worse. Yeah, so. correct. Absolutely. And I think addressing that comprehensively, just like the sexual wellness or hormones and um, is important. So like, again, we'll do a lot of things like hormone optimization is going to already increase muscle mass, metabolism, help them lose weight. They're more energetic for a workout. We have peptides we can do, you know, so that then you're controlling all the other aspects of it. So we do that way before we ever, you know, got into body contouring if yeah. there mm-hmm. was weight loss that needed to happen first. But again, skin excess and laxity is not something, you know, that can yeah. always yeah. be corrected. And so. those patients were saying, this is surgical. Yeah. 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 Well, and just making, again, it's about them getting the results they want. And if you can't provide it, we need to tell them. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. There's, because otherwise they're unhappy. 
and you don't want unhappy patients. They want results. So if they decide to proceed with something, despite you telling them, that's mm -hmm. one thing, but you got to be yeah. transparent. Yeah. And I think in our industry, honesty is, it yeah, is yeah. with anything. Honesty mm -hmm. is, is kind yeah. of first priority with yeah. everybody. Faraday, you, 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 again, you tried to sneak another one by me. <laughs> the, okay. The O shot. What I, you hear? What is that? So I we can't imagine your, oh. catching you that you try yeah. to sit <laughs> yeah. in. That's I just the throw those things yeah, out like, there. We got all like kinds roll, of stuff. It just like rolls off your tongue. I'm like, wait a second, what is that? Yeah. So we take platelet-rich plasma. So we take mm -hmm. your blood, spin it down, take the platelet-rich plasma from there, and then we re-inject that into the clitoral hood and in through the G spot. So we are helping build collagen elastin, supporting that urethra, and it helps a lot with stress incontinence for women. So and we get that orgasmic improvement in strength, and then we also get to help support that collagen elastin build in between the anterior your vaginal wall and that urethra so it helps help some of that incontinence in my be there and like nerves and blood flow so and nerves and blood flow like of course with everything so prp starting orthopedics mm -hmm. you know with all of the growth factors in prp and platelets so you know when we take that injected vaginally we're doing it right through the g-spot mm -hmm. and into the clitoris so you're going to get nerve regeneration and blood vessel regeneration so you have increased blood flow which is lubrication increased sensitivity and again collagen last and support of urethra so orgasmic the o shot you know so yeah. just i mean women love the o shot and i love we love it's to a double it whammy with, yeah orgasmic yeah. strength and stress and incontinence. stress incontinence <laughs> yeah and it's not going to do an overall tightening of the vaginal wall so like when you're talking about laxity we're not going to get we're not going to be addressing that with an o shot we love to pair O shot with our vaginal rejuvenation because you're going to basically do something to the vaginal canal. Usually it's heating in some way. So we have three different devices. So it's either RF heating, RF heating, but we're penetrating. So like a micro milling in the vaginal canal and then or we're doing um, the erbium, you know, which mm -hmm. we're penetrating with heat, telling it it's injured. So you get collagen elastin stimulation, mm -hmm. tightening, and then blood flow and nerve sensitivity. And then we dump a bunch of growth factors in with the first treatment so that we have the shot going with the first treatment with amazing results. So, yeah. How do yeah. you do anesthesia for that? Because I would imagine that just sounds like it would hurt. No. Topical and a little bit of lidocaine. Really? Mm -hmm. A clitoral block. A clitoral block. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just so like with do. the P yeah. shot for guys, we do a P now. Yeah, we do oh, do we do do P shot now, too. Now, yeah, I got it. I'm gonna ask. Okay, just go ahead and lay it on me. He's like, <laughs> guys say like that. zero, maybe one yeah. from that initial injection from the lidocaine for the P now block. Maybe a one, but most men say on a pain scale of zero to ten, they're a zero. Okay, and and what does that do? So, what does the P shot do? Same thing for women. Increase blood flow, right? Elasticity, build that collagen elastin, help with erectile strength, um, blood flow, all of that. We're doing it and we're usually pairing it again like we pair women with Botiva or Morpheus V. We're pairing it with like a Gaines Wave treatment. So we're trying to improve that blood flow and then trying to get that vessels, right, to repair and hold all that blood flow in. What is Gaines Wave? I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, we're just opening yeah, your like, world yeah, into like, all I'm the sexual wellness. So this is what we <laughs> so do we, yeah. here. So we, again, talk about sex all yeah. day long. All day like, long. You know, sex so and hormones. Yeah. With hormones, we're talking about sexual stuff. And so, because again, people don't have a lot of places to go, right? Men or right. women. So, and we all age. We kind of talked about that earlier. We're all going to experience aging. Mm -hmm with time so with women it's laxity decreased orgasmic strength urinary incontinence especially with hormonal changes or pregnancies mm -hmm. where men it's inevitable too that eventually they're going to have decreased blood flow decreased erection quality decreased reliability so they might lose like morning erections or nocturnal erections or they can't consistently keep an erection right women can so, hide it but men can't mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. everybody, everybody in the room knows what's going on with you. So, <laughs> so they have different things. But Gaines wave is an acoustic shock wave that basically is telling the tissue it's injured versus the laser for women. And so it's telling the tissue it's injured so you get blood vessel repair. And again, the penile vessels are the smallest in the body. So they're one to two millimeters. Coronary artery is three to four. Carotid's even bigger. So it's, the, it's a barometer of vascular health. So they're going to notice erection changes before they notice anything else. So... You can do so the earlier the better. So mm -hmm. if it's like, you know, I'm 
maybe drinking, maybe losing an erection, can't keep it, but then maybe I'm not drinking. It's happening a couple times. That's the time. Erections are changing in the morning. Noticing Mm -hmm. minor changes. So you basically are doing it over the penis, over the scrotum to tell the tissue it's injured. So blood vessels and nerves. And then the smooth muscle, the corpus cavernosum, you know, you're going to improve the health of that collagen elastin. So when we get the blood flow in, we want it to stay. So the P-shot kind of focuses in on the penis and all the regeneration there. So likewise, we do gains wave, pair it with the P-shot. Dump all those growth factors in. No no man left behind. We can't do women and not men. We do women and men. Yeah. Yeah. Mind is blown. Yeah, I was was reading your your website, which is beautiful, by the way. Thank you. But I was looking, I was like, I don't know what half of this stuff is. Mm. Like, I've got a lot to learn. Well, we don't like learn, like, again, we don't learn hormones in traditional medicine. We're both Mm -hmm. traditionally trained and you don't learn it. And I think endocrinologists don't even know it because they frequently don't have people, like don't have women as they age on estrogen or on the right thyroid replacement. So you have to almost branch out and learn it. But like what we're doing is on the realm of regenerative medicine. So lasers are regeneration. You know, so now we're starting to talk about how to regenerate. And I think that's the next step. Like, that's almost like a revolution in and of itself. Not the sexual one. This one might have boundaries, you know, <laughs> you know but this but one is awesome time. because you're using, you, you're basically regenerating tissue instead of sometimes um, you know, cutting or using medicines for it. Mm-hmm. If it can. So if it's mild. So if they're coming for, I mean, it's almost as if, like med spa versus surgical, like your filler is augmenting what you're doing surgically and they're working together. Mm -hmm. And so that's frequently what we need for tissue function too. And sexual function is we need everything to work together. And so, yeah. And I, and and that's, you you bring up the surgical part of it, that that's plastic surgery is moving, you know, has been moving in a regenerative direction for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing more and more, um, regenerative treatments mm-hmm. kind of take over. You know, it's unusual for me to do a facelift now without pairing it with fat injections. Yeah. Um, okay. And, you know, fat grafting to the breast, to the buttocks, you know, f- all over the body has kind of become really standard in a lot of practices. Or even more contouring, probably with mm-hmm. filler, you mm-hmm. know, all of that. Or regenerating yeah. with lasers, so it's a more comprehensive exactly. treatment mm-hmm. than it ever was before. So they went mm-hmm. to surgery, surgeons for surgery, and now that's a comprehensive treatment. Right. And it's almost as if that's all that's offered. You know, they're probably going to not be as completely happy with the results because you're going to pair, you know, some contouring. So that looks great, but let's add some contouring or laser regeneration and all that. So it's kind of the same with us. It's the and again, back and the to cell health too. We got to add those hormones back in. We mm-hmm. got to treat that base function of that cell. We've got to make it as healthy as possible and make the body as healthy as possible so that when we're doing these treatments, we're not seeing regression sooner than we should. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then actually when you're talking about building bones, so like, again, when it comes to the earlier women are on hormones, so as soon as they can be, the better. Mm -hmm. So perimenopause, 40 to 55, seeing it younger now because we don't produce hormones like we used to, toxicities that we're exposed to. But the earlier you replace um, progesterone and testosterone in the perimenopause, the better because the only thing that maintains or even builds bone. So if they have like low DEXA scans and their osteoporosis or osteopenia, you can actually build bone with hormones and hormone optimization and vitamin D. So mm-hmm. that's the other thing we don't ever think about. You know, it's a pro-hormone, but it actually builds bone too and supports bone health. So, you know, then they get less bone resorption with time. You know, it's still, you're still going to have aging. You can't correct everything, but at least you can support. Mm-hmm. And slow it down a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, another question that kind of not to shift gears, but a lot, but shift gears a little bit, um, is I, you've got a really comprehensive lab in the back of your clinic for IV therapy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's been something that has been talked about a lot recently. How can IV therapy help in the kind of the post-surgical period, and I'm kind of being selfish, thinking about my my patients mm-hmm. recovering from, you know, three, four, six-hour operation. 
what do we use? When do we start? You know, how can we, how, what do we need to partner mm -hmm. to help optimize yeah. post-surgical yeah. recovery? So you get all that recovery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So high dose vitamin C has been shown in lots of studies to, um, to promote healing after mm -hmm mainly because it's an antioxidant. So it's, you know, decreases inflammation, oxidative stress, all of that is happening post-surgery, right? If they can do it before and almost immediately after, there's no complications that doesn't increase bleeding rate, nothing. So it's not gonna make anything worse with surgery or in the recovery period, but can significantly improve uh, recovery times because it's anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And so you get that inflammation and that's mainly what causes swelling and pain, right? And at least I'm thinking they can't decrease or they can't move like they used to because it's a lot of pain and swelling. Mm -hmm. And so that's right. High dose vitamin C, you know, all the way. And in fact, used for cancer therapies mm -hmm. um, or at least preventing side effects with chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's lots of benefits to just IV therapy mm -hmm. and promoting healing and making your patients get better faster. Absolutely. Maybe come wobbling into the post <laughs> appointment because that's probably a yeah. very hard appointment yes. you know lots of pain with it so yeah, yeah. um we do like here we put together all the drips you can actually even talk a little yeah. bit more about so that we mm -hmm. do a ton of different ivs we do um like dr Jer said the high dose vitamin c we do kind of like a souped up um myers cocktail so all of your b vitamins some minerals we do glutathione added on to a lot of our IV drips. Um, there's alpha lipoic acid. So a lot of things to help with antioxidants, healing just overall to feel better, getting that energy back. Um, we do NAD drips. So that is also DNA repair. Um, just quite a bit. We customize a lot of stuff. So even for our athletes, so post-workout for recovery, we do amino acids. We add um, glutamine, arginine, lysine, valine, and I'm missing one, but there's another one in that carnitine. mixture, carnitine, mm -hmm. to help with recovery after working out. So we have a pretty extensive IV lounge here that we are sitting in today that our patients can come and be, any, be here anywhere from an hour to six, depending on the drip. Wow. That's a pretty comfortable place if they're post up and a little uncomfortable. We have some rooms, too. But so the history of IV therapy, because it's interesting, because it's been used for a while, too, but because nothing is drug company sponsored or supported mm -hmm. you don't yeah no it's yeah. all about the money and if you follow the money it's yeah. so easy but now they're actually i think in 2021 or maybe in the early part of this year they just came out with high dose vitamin c as part of um cancer therapy yeah. like not just preventing side effects but cancer therapy so some studies recently and just using high dose vitamin C for cancer therapy is not just in like an adjunct to cancer therapy or preventing side effects. So it's been around for a long time, but because drug companies don't support, can't do studies, it isn't as promoted as it's going to start being, I think. So what typically would happen is regenerative medicine doctors, the ones that are doing like all the sick, the functional medicine mm -hmm. doctors. And again, that's not us. That's doctors that are doing like really sick patients with you know Lyme disease or something mm -hmm. big and they're working through it and it's a lot of work to they get a ton with that. the they gut health to, and the microbiome yeah. and all yeah. of that very they need extensive. to have all of uh, I mean they're very good at what they do which is why because it's so detailed and yeah. so mm -hmm. they have to specialize in it but they would do drips to treat those patients over like maybe four hour periods so I did my training and learned these long very complex drips and multiple trainings and then I realized Nobody's staying here for four hours to get an IV therapy drip. So I basically took and reformulated those to go over an hour. And it's based on osmolarity and blood. And so like if you're giving lactated ringers and normal saline, it's like approximately 300 milliosmoles per liter. So your drip has to be close to that too. So that's the nice thing about it now. It took a long time. It took me about a year to formulate prior to even this being open. And then make she does have a pharmacy degree. She doesn't talk a lot about that. She <laughs> so was first like, a pharmacist yeah, so before I mean, a physician. Well, so I got very, <laughs> so like, she so, talks about yeah, it like, no big yeah, deal. Yeah. I just created these. She's like a 300 milliosmolar solution. Yeah. yeah. So well, I mean, so. it took a lot of learning, but it's yeah. very, like, I loved it. And as I learned what you could do with IV therapy, like, again, there was no way I wasn't putting an IV therapy lounge in this place because it just, it, it, an adjunct to everything we do and so we do formulate customize so we can change because we know the science behind it so high dose vitamin c is technically 25 grams 
but we can do 50 grams. We can do 75 grams if we wanted to. Yeah. So we can customize, which is nice. And those but, might take a little bit longer mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. because of side effects. Yeah. And then our NAD bags NAD, do sometimes go yeah. four to six hours, but NAD the majority is of like them. a great, like, again, it's used for, like, um, addiction, alcohol, mm -hmm. drug. You can titrate up and titrate down, but it's great anti-aging mitochondrial support, too. And then I think the big thing for us for beauty is if you put glutathione in anything. So for you, like mm -hmm. recovery post-op, yeah. you know, they as soon as they can get in, and they should always do one before because it improves it already because every, like vitamin C and high dose concentrates in the white blood cell. So your immune support and anti-inflammation is highest in that um, perioperative. Mm -hmm. And then if they can get one after, it's even better. But a lot of times they're in pain and it's hard to do. Yeah. But then glutathione, because it's the master antioxidant. So all of Hollywood's doing the glutathione drips, like just for yeah. skin brightening and, you know, making everything brighter and lighter. And and so that's a big selling one, too. People come looking for it. You know, Great for because, aesthetics, but mm -hmm. also just because it's an antioxidant. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful for the body. Mm -hmm. How long before surgery for, for some of these, you know, glutathione, vitamin C infusions, how long before or how close to their surgery would you recommend somebody so come here? So I would do it within 24 hours really? of their surgery, like right before. It's not going to interfere with your surgery. Okay. Um, and of course, everybody sure. out there, talk to yeah. your surgeon before yeah. you go yeah. and get yeah. an IV. Surgeon, I feel like we yeah. have to say yeah. those I mean, things, of course. Well, but. absolutely. I mean, you don't want to let your your surgeon not know what you're doing. Exactly. Right. Very they, important. Right. They You might find out they won't do surgery when you should. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I got to throw that little yeah. caveat out there. Yeah, I would Always double check with your surgeon before you do that. But we do. Yeah. see patients here pre-op and yeah. post-op yeah neat and the other interesting thing is like peptides like yeah. so again there's like two peptides in particular that come to mind with this and so it's all part of that regenerative and once mm -hmm. you hear about it you'll be learning i know you oh yeah you'll be oh, like yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah you'll be like yeah. reading all all about the peptide all, everything like and again you know as that regenerative medicine thing just expands and blows up like you can't help but get excited to learn more about it. Um, and I think Tony Robbins Life Force book is like kind of bringing that to like the public. Sums it so all we up don't nicely. keep up. If we don't keep up, they come in asking us about, you know, certain things that we don't know anything about. So you almost have to stay up. Mm -hmm. But and I know you, it won't. Yeah, it'll be on the way home. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. What well, you, you mentioned Tony Robbins book. It's it's like on my Kindle is like yeah, next up. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I just You've started. Listening, read it. I've yeah. had so many patients come in and they're like, have you read it? You know, so as soon as I hear that and I started listening and it's exactly what we would love to learn about. But peptides are like, again, one of those regenerative medicine type of things you can do. Hmm. So BPC, CJC, have you heard anything no, about this? No, only, only the letters. Us peppering but, yeah, it in yeah, here and yeah, there in conversation. Yeah, but, yeah talk, talk, talk to me a little bit about the peptide. So growth hormone, for yeah. instance, like the growth hormone thing is like in the 90s started to be more restricted. Mm -hmm. So before that, it was being used for injury. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of athletes with injuries, they would go on growth hormone and obviously it has great benefits. For if it could be a drug, endurance. it would be perfect. It'd be a perfect drug because it has you know, decreased inflammation, healing. I mean, it does everything that testosterone does, but better. So libido, brain fog, energy, you know, healing, decreased inflammation, um, decreased lipid uh, profiles. Yeah, yeah, decreased injury, you know. So now it's restricted and you can't use it much, but now there's a peptide that can increase growth hormone. So CJC 1295 and Evermorlin. Will help diabetes. the body increase its own naturally. So we're not giving it external. So we're not shutting down the body's production, which is so important. We're just supporting its own natural production. So it is not something you have to worry about being on long term. A lot of these drugs that shut down the body's natural functioning, you've got to take that into consideration when you're starting a patient on that because you don't want to do long term damage. Right. So this is one that it will promote the body's own natural increase in growth hormone and mimic its natural rhythm at night and in the morning. So it's yeah. pretty cool. Interesting. So it's like it's like erythropoietin or EPO for mm -hmm. the audience who's who's kind of heard about that right. increased blood production. Absolutely. It's the same thing for growth hormone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Very now cool. you can optimize not only hormones and I always recommend hormone optimization first and then we'll add growth hormone optimization. So. CJC 1295 is 
growth hormone, it looks like growth hormone. It's a shorter segment of growth hormone releasing hormone. So it goes to the pituitary, has the pituitary increased growth hormone production. We still have small spikes as we age, but it peaks at 20. Mm -hmm. And so then it starts to go down. So, but they're still there. They just need to be stimulated, but not overstimulated. And growth hormone, if you're giving it, it's doing the peripheral effects and then it's shutting down your own system. Where this increases your growth hormone, goes to the liver and produces IGF-1, which does all the effects, you know, mm -hmm. all the positive effects of it. So it doesn't shut it down. And it also doesn't overstimulate if it's dosed appropriately. And of course, you have down regulation of receptors. If you take it on a continuous basis, so they used to um, cycle it every three months and come off of it for a month, but now you can do it. It's an injectable at home. Um, most of the peptides are if they're really mm -hmm. eff effective. Five days on, two days off, five days on, you know. And so it just stimulates enough, doesn't overstimulate, doesn't shut down. But now you have growth hormone optimization and all the positive benefits without the downside. Without the negative yeah. side effects. It, now, is this another, and you know, we talked earlier about being able to measure hormone levels. Is this something else that you measure and kind of track when they're on the, the peptide treatments? So you don't with this. So. Okay. So it's a small segment. So even measuring growth hormone is expensive. Yeah. And so this is growth hormone releasing hormone, but it's a small segment of it. So it's like 29 amino acids. So like you're not going to ever be able to measure that. But even then it was expensive. But you mm -hmm. can measure IGF-1 levels baseline yes. yeah. and you can measure them post. The only pre issue. Pre and post. We do it okay. pre. Mm -hmm. Finding that initial always on the screen. The, the, the big issue is like. Pre, you want a baseline that tells you it's at least at a level you're going to produce yeah. so that your pituitary is working enough and those somatotropes are working enough that they're going to work for production. But you're not going to get sustained. So by the time they're in here getting blood levels, honestly, you're not going to see a sustained because the half-life is 30 minutes, just like growth hormone releasing hormone. Mm -hmm. goes to the liver, it's produces IGF-1, does, does the effects, and then it's gone. And Tassimorlin was a third generation. So if anyone ever asked, like, Samorlin was first generation. Those so are the Arnold had, days. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what the Samorlin yeah. 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 Well, and I think some places still use it, but it does have effect on prolactin and cortisol. And so it it's affects other hormones. So you have side effects with it. And then you have um, CJC, which is second generation, which I think is ideal for use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tassimorlin was a third generation, temporarily not available, but because of i think it wasn't a regulatory i think something to do with COVID. honestly most of the peptides if they went away for a short period of time was because somebody was using them you know mm -hmm. in the COVID scenario somehow and, or another yeah. and they got pulled. but it does get you sustained results with that mm -hmm. which is really not what you want so it was used in a more short term for somebody with maybe like abdominal like metabolic syndrome mm -hmm. so if a man comes in or a woman again like mm -hmm. with metabolic syndrome you know, then that was a better peptide to use. But okay. short term, though, yeah, yeah. not long short term. term. Where CJC at Bamorlin, we can stay on long term. Okay. And you actually see better results long term. When you say long term, what's a treatment course? At least six months before okay. we tell everyone, give it at least three to six months to start seeing sustained uh, benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So six months is ideal. Like, because yeah. you're going to get your biggest strides, like Faraday said, in three to six months, but you can stay on it indefinitely if you want. You know, because it optimizes growth hormones, so it prepares your body not to get injured, and your like endurance is better, your muscle building is better. So honestly, for women, and you can cycle them off and back on, but without tumor history, you know, mm -hmm. then there's not that contraindication. But for muscle, for women as we age, you know, again, one of the biggest complaints is weight gain and body composition change. So that's why you know all of a sudden we're seeing sagging. We want you know arm surgery, you know, even the thighs, which I'm not sure there's a big, Top I don't the know knees. how mm -hmm. much you can do for like above the knees in abdominal. And so this actually does a great job of body composition changes. But again, it's a slow process over time because you're optimizing growth hormone again. Yeah. That's really interesting. I didn't, I was totally unaware that you would see, start seeing, you know, surface changes yeah. with oh, something with a, you know, peptide infused. That well, is really cool. And then cool. Ebimorlin is paired with <laughs> CJC typically. And epimorlin just inhibits the negative feedback on the pituitary. So basically, they're both increasing growth hormone, but they're used together usually. So very cool neat. Stuff. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, as you were talking, mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned the testosterone, and I had a question about testosterone and 
some of these like Propecia. Um, because I know a lot of guys who are in my demographic are concerned with hair loss and or thinning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how does testosterone and Propecia work together? Can you can you get testosterone supplementation if you need it and still be taking Propecia for your hair? Do, do you need to? So we can go on forever and ever. Yeah. Forever and ever and ever. So testosterone mm -hmm. converts into dihydrotestosterone, mm -hmm. which is 10 times more anabolic. And so when we're seeing our patients for testosterone, male and female, because mm -hmm. females can see that same yeah. because it's the same pathway, we're always looking at those DHT levels. So there are medications that can slow that conversion so that we're not seeing that excess hair loss. Um, there are some natural supplements like salt palmetto, right? So we put minerals. patients on minerals. We put patients on some supplements sometimes to help with that. But spironolactone is great mm -hmm. um, to slow that conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. We can also um, hit those uh, follicles at the site and do topicals to help minimize that DHT response at the hair follicle site. So there is a lot of options there for men and women that we watch on the front end. So we grab those DHT levels on the very front side of it. Some of the patients we see that have come from clinics that are just running shots weekly, right? Yeah. They're not looking mm -hmm. at any of that. So we're correcting that when we come in. So I think it's almost like, again, um, dosed appropriately, treated appropriately, followed appropriately. Exactly. You can mm -hmm. prevent any side effects that you're going to get in, you know, in dose appropriately so that you don't get um, also not just side effects, but adverse long-term effects. So I think getting more data points at the beginning, like a DHT level, what's your free testosterone, your binding globulin, like all of those are important. Dosing is appropriately um, done so that like, again, pellets, you know, is something that you make a small incision and you insert pellets under the skin that slowly release. And so that slow release, keep your levels up and keep them up versus injectables. So that once a week at the low T clinic mm -hmm. and, You're and then down hormones. and and down and yeah. creams don't work. I mean, nobody feels better in creams, but they're like a variation. And so the more that you go up and down, we want test say testosterone. But if you're going up and down, you're getting those variations. When you're peaking, you're converting. Mm -hmm. So estrogen for men, man boobs. Like we're very, because again, I want men to know that there's options. And so the yes. once a week is not a good option. I mean, we do injectables. We dose it differently because once you get an adverse effect, it's harder to treat, like hair loss or growth or playing catch tissue. Up. Yeah. And so. Or we're sending them to yeah. surgeons. Yeah. But again, it can. So DHT, even if not high can concentrate in the hair follicle, like Faraday mm -hmm. said. And so putting a topical on like Propecia, but you never mm -hmm. want to take, the most important takeaway from all of this is you never want to be on Propecia without testosterone optimization. Because yeah. there are lots of studies that show erectile dysfunction that they report to be irreversible. So if you're not optimized, so self-treatment, over, you know, mm -hmm. the internet treatments, like, hey, I want testosterone. The, the, the hymns, um, the hymns yes, treatment, yes, yeah. yeah. Not mm -hmm. a good option, no. you know, because okay. that's when you run into trouble. You want mm -hmm. to go to somebody you trust. They're trust or they're testing everything, but also even if it's concentrating at the hair follicle, if you want to use finasteride, that's the way to use it because you're just using it topically and it prevents that conversion at the hair follicle. So that's good to know. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's it's complex and like we like again it's what we love, but like you have to know and manage it well to prevent because. And even then, sometimes we'll run into issues. So it's problem, troubleshooting, problem solving. Absolutely. You know, and a lot of that can be based on a conversation. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And then good relationships good with compounding pharmacies because those yeah, pharmacists yeah. have all kinds of fun little concoctions oh, they, they mm -hmm. can make yeah. for us. Oh, I bet. Yeah. 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 And there's a couple really good ones locally. Absolutely. That are a wealth of knowledge if ever, like, you're, you have questions about, you know, mm -hmm. dosing or a different route or, yeah. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just send it to you. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. 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 You yeah. send us yeah. the hormones. Yeah. We'll send yeah. you the I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just send this to you. That's, yeah. That is above yeah. my pay grade. Yeah. As you can tell by the questions I've been asking. No, no. I think it's a great conversation to have because like everything that you're doing, you know, is a comprehensive approach to yeah. it and knowing when yeah. you treat the What's inside and the outside. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think that's, a, that's kind of the takeaway. That's what I've gotten from this is that, you know, aesthetics kind of they say beauty is skin deep it, it actually isn't it, it, mm, it goes, goes deeper it goes Much way deeper, deeper. Yeah. and you know probably the best treatment is a marriage of 
the you know the surface treatments, what we can do with our lasers, you know, mm-hmm. injectables, things like that, surgery, and then hormone treatments, peptide treatments, IV infusions. I mean, it's just overall wellness. Yeah, it Mm -hmm. it is. We want every patient to be the healthiest version of themselves they can be when they walk out these doors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. There is one that we haven't talked about. You know, I'm like, I know, you know, it's our favorite. So BPC is a peptide that we haven't. And this is actually a great. Another one. Perioper- there's just yeah. one more. The yeah. two peptides that really work are CJC for growth hormone. Yeah. And again, for even us, like using peptides to optimize and, you know, we oh. want to be our best selves for our patients too. Absolutely. And again, if we're living examples, they want to live it too. So like they want to see their providers, you know, doing the same things, right? Yeah. Or having but, personal experience, so they can yeah. talk about it. Yeah. So but BPC-157, BPC stands for Body Protective Compound. And actually decreases inflammation, wound healing. It helps with tendon healing and ligament healing. It is amazing. We see this for patients with acute and chronic injuries. Um, And we see a lot post-operative. We Mm -hmm. have some local physicians that will send their surgery patients to us for BPC to help um, expedite the healing process, the recovery process Mm -hmm. post-surgery. Now, is this something that you can do before surgery to... Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And the yeah, quicker you can do it before, like definitely 30 days before, but if you can be on it even longer, once you like, once you learn a little more about BPC, you'll love it as much as I do. Like it's again, just Could out of all the amazing. peptides, yeah. it's probably the one that, you know, nothing in life is like immediate gratification, but this yeah. is a peptide that within two to four weeks, patients have relief of pain. Wow. Mm-hmm. It is amazing it and, changed my husband's life so personal experience my husband was walking around with pain of seven eight every single day on a 10 scale with chronic back pain he was very active athlete very hard on his body with bpc he's down to a zero one wow just mm-hmm. because of inflammation and the compression on nerves and just overall just that pain even on the if joints. they come in with an acute injury so like again so a lot of patients remote with BPC because mm-hmm. it's hard to get peptide physicians and, you know, appropriately prescribing physicians nationwide. So um, they will reach out remotely, even if they have like, so if it's local remote, they have an acute injury that they want. And again, they're on the internet, right? Searching. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they're like BPC, like what helps with, yeah. there's so much. Have you heard of Ben Greenfield? Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he does like a blog on it and basically oh, yeah. says this shit should be illegal. It probably will be soon because I had improvement of this and this and you know, so everyone's talking about it. There is tons of stuff on the internet. So when they reach out, if they have acute injury that we're treating, if they have some chronic pain, it's gone too. Um, but for surgery, the quicker you can use it before and definitely 30 days is a good time frame. You're prepping the body. You can do it perioperatively. Again, no drug interactions. It's not a drug. It's not going to affect surgery. And then post-op, there like it allows inflammation, but not too much. So most of the the healing, you know, that takes so long is because they're inflamed. They're it's painful. They can't move. And the orthopedic results are phenomenal. And so as orthopedic surgeons start to use it more and more, you know, sometimes they don't need to do surgery, but if they do, they're getting faster recovery times. Can you combine the BPC injection with a vitamin C infusion? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can combine it with CJC. You can combine it with testosterone. You can use it really in conjunction with any of the therapies that we do here. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. I'm I'm definitely going to have to look more into that. That's that's definitely cool. It's like it's one of my probably favorite. my favorite. Mm-hmm. Just like and across so the board you, with you our patients. I know. She snuck a lot in. She, she and did. She did. Yeah. Yeah. Usually oh, yeah. just yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. BPC, CJC. Yeah. 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 yeah, she couldn't let yeah. it. Yeah. Testosterone, P shot, yeah. you're good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's exactly. your order. Yeah. <laughs> what was the order again? I'll have to listen to the Yeah, exactly. So anything else you think we need to like for hormone or doctor hormone? For healing, definitely. We kind of hit the two main ones for with surgery where peptides is that CJC, epimorlin and BPC. But you would, it is amazing the BPC results, the feedback we get from patients. Just it's been so life changing for so many of our patients. I think that's why it's probably my favorite because you get quick results and yeah. nothing in life is quick. And I feel like a lot of times we just put band-aids on things, steroid injections, right? 
Let's just yeah. stick some cortisol in, uh, um, cortisol in it, and then um, we're just breaking down bone yeah. versus a functional change. That is really yeah, because that that's that is you know a lot and a lot of a lot of Western medicine is putting band aids on things, yeah. and so that, this is this functional is exciting, change is pretty cool. When, and just to hear knowing about. that there's so small a percentage of patients that your your surgical patients that are even hormonally optimized, and knowing you know the increased um, or decreased healing time, you know, anti-inflammatory effects, you know, the healing times, the immune support, you know, yeah. just hormones alone, just knowing, yeah. you know, as your patients, you know, listen to this and, you know, we're prepping and as you're talking to them, I'm sure they, you know, they have a period of time, everything's a, a wait time now, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you yeah. can't, so they have that time where they can at least start thinking about it beforehand and help you, you know, get results that are, quicker for sure you know, more sustained better all that yeah, yeah. That, I, well that's that that is certainly true i'm I, I, like i said i've learned a lot today mm -hmm. it's been a lot of fun <laughs> um is there anything from that any questions that you have that your patients would want to know about surgery as it relates to hormones or just in general i think the biggest ones are kind of do we need to come off, right? That's yeah. always a finding a surgeon yeah. that is not going to freak out that they're on hormones, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. With pellets, we can't really remove the yeah, pellets, you can't do anything about right? It. So if it's something where if we're doing an estrogen pellet, if we need to wait, mm -hmm. what does that look like for the patient? Mm -hmm. Can we go to a transdermal if we have to? Um, and then downtime. I think mm -hmm. that's always like the biggest thing with patients too is, well, if I'm doing X, Y, Z with you all, mm -hmm. and then I'm doing surgery here, what's my mm -hmm. downtime look like? How much time would I have to be off hormones? How much time do I have to wait till I get to the gym? Because mm -hmm. that's big. A lot of our patients are doing a lot of um, just mm -hmm. self-improvement. They're in the gym. They're working out. They're doing all of that. They're working with a trainer, trying mm -hmm. to get those body composition changes along with surgery. Sure. So what does downtime look like with most surgeries, time frames? So it's, and that's a question that I get a lot, you know, we kind of go over in the consults and for most surgeries, I guess a general rule would be you're pretty much off of anything for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. After about two weeks, then it's, it's kind of light exercise, thinking treadmills, um, you know, walking around the block, you know, maybe uh, you know, walking up and down hills, get your mm -hmm. heart rate up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but really six weeks is kind of the cutoff for intense exercise. I tell, okay. you know, tell a lot of patients, whether it's tummy tucks, breast surgery, facelift surgery, typically no lifting and no bouncing for six weeks. Okay. And then, no bouncing. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of any kind. Of any kind. Stay of any, off the trampoline. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 what, you know, you determine what bouncing is yeah. for you. Right? So, you, know, you know. But um, but yeah, it's, it's so six weeks out of the gym for sure. Mm -hmm. But you're you're you know, I want patients to be up and moving the day of surgery. You know, there isn't laying around is mm -hmm. where your complications happen. Mm -hmm. And so up and moving to a point. For someone that's getting a facelift or doing fat grafting into the cheeks mm -hmm. or into the face, how soon can they do laser resurfacing after surgery? It, great question. It, it's a good, really good question. It, so it depends on what else is done. Injections typically do laser resurfacing same time. Yeah, where you, the, yeah, where you, you the, the tricky part is with a facelift. And because you don't want to, you, you have to lift the skin up to mm -hmm. reposition the muscles and do all mm -hmm. the work that's needed to get the result. And you don't want to stress the skin by lifting it up and then set it back down and blast mm -hmm. it from the top of mm -hmm. the laser. And so you have to be really careful over that skin that has been elevated. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of matching the right procedure. You know, if we're doing a deep plane facelift, that is typically really limited skin undermining, uh, you know, above the jawline. Okay. And so I can be more aggressive with laser resurfacing doing that is if we're doing a smaller facelift that with less muscle tightening, mm -hmm that relies on a little bit more skin undermining. Okay, gotcha. To get what that about result. treatment for scars? How quickly for um, treating with either creams or lasers for scars post-surgery? Really, almost after the, the tape has come off. Love it, um, yeah. Yeah, it Love is it. right mm -hmm. after, you know, because that, you're looking, That's you know, scar is essentially healed 
less than a week. If it's, you know, if the skin edges are put together right, you know, that skin has healed over in about 48 hours. We want to let it kind of thicken. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, once that tape comes off, whether it's a week or two weeks, you can start after it. laser treatments <laughs> right then. I love it. But again, mm -hmm. talk yeah. to your surgeon yeah. before <laughs> lasering yeah. a surgical I'm like, you got to throw that caveat yeah. out there <laughs> always. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because we just, that's what they just said. We were a little mm -hmm. surprised at the most recent conference we were at. They're like, as soon as everything's off. And we're like, yeah. it seems so. Even so like quick. vaginal yeah. treatments are like yeah. the day the baby comes out. I'm like, what? They're like in other well, countries. They yeah. were talking about more <laughs> also stretch marks. Like, yeah. So if you have stretch marks, as soon as you deliver. <laughs> Come on. Get on, you know, because they're darker at that point yeah. in the, the revive versus, yeah. you know, a scar tissue once it's white. So yeah. Stretch marks are tough, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, stretch yeah. marks are tough to treat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But we, I think that we have some we, things for that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and I think that like just the the fractional like mm -hmm. erbium yeah. is really good. Is if sooner you the better. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fractional erbium, ones. and then and then you know for the for the the purples or reds, mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you can you can zap those. Yeah, you know, much with, much more responsive. Yeah. Too. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. much better there. than the white. Yeah. Old. Yeah. Once they're white, you yeah. know, you're 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 in for kind of the long haul to get yeah. that oh, yeah. to improve. <laughs> what about with the fat transfers? Is the fat transfer when you do it, is that like how long does that procedure take? Is that an in office procedure? Is there a lot of downtime with that? Um, versus like a surgical? So it, it really it depends on what we're treating. Um, if we're treating a small area, um, even treating an area like the backs of the hands. Those are good in office procedures. When we start talking about full face rejuvenation with fat, um, it tends to be a little bit more involved. I like to do those in the operating room. The, the procedure length, if I'm doing it in, you know, in our surgery center, which is right below my office, a full face fat grafting session can take 45 minutes or an hour. Okay. It's, it's not okay. a lengthy procedure. Um, in the office, it tends to take a little bit longer just because you're awake. We want to make sure you're comfortable. We're, things mm -hmm. are a lot slower because we're making sure that every little area is properly anesthetized before we do anything. Mm -hmm. um, the real recovery with fat transfer is not pain. It's swelling. Because mm -hmm. fat is, as you guys know, fat is very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And so, especially in thinner areas, so under the, around the eyes, okay. um, around the mouth, the lips especially, mm -hmm. they tend to really swell. And so, you have to budget. I tell people, you know, give yourself two weeks wow. before okay. you're really out in public because you'll be noticeably swollen. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So, it sounds like almost if you're going to do a decent area, the operating room is the better place to be for those procedures. It, it's, it's, it's much more control. comfortable. Yeah. It, it's just more comfortable. Um, gotcha. And I know some people that's are... that's a huge part of it yeah. when these mm -hmm. are all, you mm -hmm. know, extra. Nobody has to. They're elective, yeah. right? We yeah. want everybody to be comfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's surgery you want, not surgery you need. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So the operating room is, is kind of my preferred venue. But if, you know, if the patient wants to and is you have to have the right temperament. If you're an anxious person, you know, <laughs> having... You know, facial fat grafting in the office when you're awake is not the right procedure. And I think even like yeah. you're doing all procedures, all operations on of an independent um, surgery center. So like more control over even anesthesia and right and patients, you know, entering and leaving and much more private um, as circumstance than at a hospital. Right. Based. Right. Yeah. So our our office. I'm very fortunate that. My office is directly above the surgery center, and the only thing that the entire building does is cosmetic plastic surgery. So we have the same OR team. We've got the same team of, of anesthetists. We've got the same nurses at the same building. That's all Everything, we do yeah. every day. And so we've really, over time, taken great pains to make the entire experience from kind of start to finish as comfortable, private, you know, you're not going to run into your friends or, mm -hmm. you know, we see a lot of nurses, a lot of healthcare mm -hmm. providers, physicians, 
and they don't want to run into no. their friends right. as they're <laughs> asleep and half naked and you well, know having cosmetic go, surgery. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Or go, or go to, to the hospital. A yeah. separate <laughs> registration area. And then you're in a waiting room that's public. And so yeah. there's so many downsides to doing it. Yeah. at a hospital based yeah it's it's really surgery. it's really been a mm-hmm. been a fantastic setup that's awesome yeah so i love it now i knew that was a huge advantage like yeah. big oh, yeah. advantage because yeah. a lot of patients i mean again just like you said they want privacy yeah and that hospital experience is anything but plus you're stuck with hospital equipment mm-hmm. you're stuck in hospital guidelines and hospital guidelines mm-hmm. and you know mm-hmm. so hospital requirements yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> um you know, in our, our surgery center, to speak to that, you know, the surgery center goes through the same accreditation process that the hospital does. Oh, I'm sure. And yeah, so from, from a safety standpoint, from all that is exactly the same. It's just that, you know, the um, administration. Is there we go. Friendly. That was a nice, that was a really nice way <laughs> yeah. of putting that. That was very PC. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> no, I so. think that in addition, though, I think you have, like, even though you go through the same accreditation process, you probably have better treatment protocols, anesthesia protocols. A little bit more stringent. Like recovery, like things aren't controlled. So likewise, yeah. better yeah. It's, it's, it's It's geared towards mm-hmm. aesthetic patients. Yes, love it. So It's a big difference. Yeah, it mm-hmm. is. It's really been, been a fantastic setup. That's awesome. So. Well, awesome. So it sounds like we've like covered a ton. I love it. This, yeah, yes. this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, this has gonna, been a lot of fun. We're doing this again. Absolutely. Oh, Let's do for it. Sure. So I thank you so much for being part of this. And, oh, well, thank you. And actually initiating. Like, I love it. Um, that's perfect. We have so much to cover in the future. Like we can talk about so many different things, oh, different procedures, different, different yeah. lasers, different treatments. Yeah, and I'm we sure. We do whole shows on yes, this. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. We might even, if we're doing like a RevMD, you know, just an open forum and we need a guy present for, you know, the guy opinion. We'll bring Dr. Totally. Hall on, right? Totally. Yeah. 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 He'll let us know for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, again, listen, subscribe, share with friends, leave some comments or even your experience or questions. And we're willing to deep dive into anything wellness and aesthetics. And thank you, Dr. Hall and Faraday for making this such an interesting uh, segment and podcast. It's been wonderful. So Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. All right, everybody. I, I need that little exploding head emoji. I learned a ton on that show. I hope you guys had a, had a good time. Um, please, if you haven't already, ring the little bell on YouTube, like it, subscribe it, share it with your friends, and we'll see you at the next show.